Welcome to the Dropship Podcast, where you'll learn how to build and grow a high-ticket dropshipping business and hear stories from successful e-commerce entrepreneurs. Let's kick this thing off. Hey there, welcome to the Dropship Podcast. John here with you. This is a solo episode today. We've done a few of these lately, um, which has been a bit different. In this episode, I'm uh, sharing a recording from a question and answer session I did uh, recently where I took questions from around our various places on the internet, our YouTube channel, Facebook groups, Facebook page, uh, and about dropshipping, about business, and answered those. Some were pre-submitted, some were thrown at me live, and I answered them on the spot. Uh, and we covered a lot of different ground here, ranging from things around suppliers to Google Ads, conversion rate optimization, and so on. These are always a fun thing to do. I enjoy them very much, uh, and I do them fairly regularly. So, if you'd love to join in with one live, uh, and actually, or, or get a chance to ask your questions and have me answer them. Uh, make sure you're in either our Facebook group uh, or subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll get notified of such things. You can find the links to both of those uh, below the video. So all you need to do is is head on over there. You can follow us on Facebook as well, Instagram, whatever you like. Um, And I tend to uh, do about one of these a month live in those places. Um, So head on over, subscribe there, um, and join in on the next one that happens. Um, But for the time being, let's jump into this recording. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you soon. So Cassie's question was, is there a way to use augmented reality as a mobile feature for products, like a view this in your room feature on your website? Um, Cool. That's a good question. I don't think I've had that one before. Thank you. Um, So uh, the answer is yes, there are ways that you can do that, um, that you can add functionality to your website that will let users view a product uh, in your, in their home or in a space. It might be in a business or an office um, potentially. Um, Now I'm going to say that I haven't used these myself because I've never really Uh, My very first business I ever had, I probably could have used this where I was selling lights and chandeliers and things like this. I think it would have been a a good tool to have back then, Um, but this sort of technology wasn't available in a way that was easy to add to Shopify stores, at least back then. So I never used it in that circumstance. I think it's a feature that's very more heavily used in the homeware space. So like furniture, things like that, um, where uh, all where customers need to measure things to work out if it's going to fit in a space. Um, and, and so usually that that's like furniture or things of that sort of nature. And certainly if you're selling those sort of products, which are not necessarily products that I recommend you sell, um, that can be a pain point for customers. You would be surprised how many customers I used to have when I sold lights that couldn't work out whether like a hanging decorative light was going to be too big or too small for the space that they wanted to put it in. Um, So helping people to work that out definitely is a great pain point to solve. Um, Now, in terms of what's the the actual solution here, um, firstly, I would say, if you are looking at using this sort of thing, uh, Shopify actually has their own AR app, um, like a a Shopify designed and built app. It's called Shopify AR. Um, That's been around for a little while. and so that would probably be uh, where I would um, uh, where I would suggest you look first if you're looking into this sort of thing, just because it is a you know f- native kind of Shopify type deal. Uh, like I say, I haven't used it, um, and I would think that you know the success of this sort of thing will depend a little bit on. Um, the quality of the images that you have for your products. Uh, It may help for products sometimes with AR to have video and or 3D models as well, Um, which once again, are all things you can have created, but are not generally often things that you'll get from your supplier out of kind of out of the box if you like. Um, So uh, that's, that's one I would look at. There's another one called 3Kit 
um, which can help you build 3D models of products if you need 3D models of products to, to provide a kind of AR experience. Um, and then there's there's a range of other ones out there. Like there's, there's um, I've seen one, it's called Zero something that, you can use for like shoes, like you can you can have an AR thing of what shoes would look like on your feet. Now we're not going to be selling shoes in high ticket drop shipping, but there are a range of other kind of, um, I guess, product specific type tools out there. Shopify AR is one that is is a broader thing. Uh, if you're in the um, uh, in the furniture or homeware space, uh, House. If you've got your products listed on House. Um, they have an AR app, which you could hook up to your site as well. Uh, so there's there's a few solutions out there. I mean, if, if you want to find a solution, like I say, Shopify AR would be the first thing I'd look at. Um, past that, I mean, just go to Google and, and Google like Google search, literally, you know, AR app for Shopify. And you could add on like a thing like for furniture or for whatever your product category is, because there may be some sort of um, special kind of, product category out there um, that uh, you could use. So thanks for the question, Cassie. That was a good one. All right, let's rock right on here. Afsa uh, posted a question earlier. How do I offer a payment plan for customers apart from third-party finance companies like Afterpay? As far as I know, not everybody uses these apps and they have purchasing limits. I have seen one brand offering payment plans for uh items over five thousand dollars i wonder how they are doing it uh look so most people in the high ticket dropshipping space um that are offering um payment plan type options for customers would be using a third-party finance app uh such and, and there's a whole range of those afterpay is not really a good one for high ticket drop shipping because they do have caps uh, but there are ones that have higher caps or ones that you can negotiate higher caps. So you've got tool like if you're in Australia, Zip Money, Zip Pay, Hum, like there, there's a whole bunch. If you're in the US, you know, you've got things like Klarna, uh, Bread, I don't know. There, there is tons of firm, you know, there, there's lots of different ones out there. So certainly shop around those, um, you know, customers, you know, how many customers use them? Um uh and um i think for me probably like 10 percent or less of customers actually want to use those things for high ticket products uh generally when you're doing high ticket you're selling products to people with money like credit cards and things like that and so if i'm a customer and i'm wanting to buy a high ticket product and i'm, I'm you know you're generally going to be selling to people who are kind of upper middle to upper class in high ticket drop shipping, right? So I've probably got a credit card that's got a pretty high limit on it uh, that I'm going to prefer to utilize for such purchases because I'm going to get things like points, right? Um, and so, you know, payment plans don't tend to have a massive uptake rate, um, particularly not on the B2C side for high ticket drop shipping in my experience. And I've seen across a lot of stores um, and I've never really seen them be a big thing. So to me, this isn't a big question, that big a question to answer anyway. Uh, outside of that, how would you offer it if you weren't going to use a third party finance thing? Like, I mean, I'm sure there might be some sort of, like to be able to do that, you're essentially extending people credit right? In a way, right? So um, this is this is the value of the third-party finance companies. Like they do the checks and everything. So for you to offer it, you, you would have to either take all of the risk on yourself uh, and have the capital to offer payment plans um, because you've got to buy the product and ship it to the customer before they paid for it, right? And they're going to pay for it over time. So you've got to have the capital behind you to, do, to offer that. Um, but you also have to be able to credit check people uh, and you have to have a process for that because you are like, a, you know, payment op, payment plans are essentially ex like in, in the sense where you're giving them a product, like a physical product that you've paid for, you're extending them credit. And so there has to be checks there. And so the, the benefit of the third party finance companies like Afterpay or whatever is they do all, they do those checks for you and they take all the risk. Uh, and that's why we talk about using them 
because I, I just don't see, I mean, yeah, maybe there's some other option out there of some other company you could partner up with to get this done. I don't know, but like, I don't really see the benefit to be honest, like offering payment plans is not going to think be the thing if you're just starting out that gets you to sit seven figures of, in revenue. It's also not going to be the thing that gets you to eight figures in revenue. You could do it completely without any sort of payment plan option to get to those sort of numbers. So, I mean, if using the third-party finance type stuff is not an option for you, I just wouldn't bother, honestly. I mean, I wouldn't even worry about answering this question um, because the vast majority of the people in your market are not going to be um going to be interested in it okay i'm going to flip over and answer a some live questions so i'll, I'll go between live questions and and um pre-submitted questions uh the next question i can see here uh coming over from youtube addy asks a question it, hi addy thanks for the question is keyword research the only way you can validate your niche some niches i was looking up such as dairy equipment don't have high keyword searches um well keyword research is not really how i validate a niche in the first place um it is part of that so the only real sense in in sort of niche validation that i'm looking at uh, and the way our process that we follow at dropship breakthrough goes is uh where um looking at traffic volume sure um and and that sort of thing but like i'm not doing the full keyword research piece that we might do say for search engine optimization or something like that further down the track as we get further and further uh into growing and marketing one of these businesses there are a range of other factors that we're looking at um for validating a niche things like competition things like how many suppliers are available how many products all of these sort of things what's the nature of the products uh, you know, who's the customer that we're going to serve, et cetera, et cetera. And so those things combined, as well as considering the traffic volume, um, give you what you need to pick a good niche. And, and I know there's a lot of people out there who love to agonize over picking a niche and think they need to look at more, which I would find, you know, perplexing it, that, if you're in the habit of hearing somebody who's done it thousands of times and then thinking you need to do something different or more, that's a habit you need to break because it's going to set you up to fail, right? Um, the way we do it has worked so many, so many times, it's basically irrefutable. So you don't need to do keyword research. Now, if you see stuff like dairy equipment, you know, that's, uh, that, that's fairly niche for sure. It depends kind of what, what country you might be looking in and that sort of thing. Um, and so if it's looking small, then I probably wouldn't do just dairy equipment. Like I'd probably, I'd probably take a wider view, right? So where's the dairy equipment's going to be at a dairy? What else is at a dairy? Farmers, cows, what's all the other stuff that they need, right? Like, um, you know, I go and stay on a dairy farm once a year. Uh, and if I, if I said the people who run that dairy are my uh, ideal customer, then it's not just going to be the equipment that's in the actual dairy that's like milking the cows and doing all that sort of stuff that they need. There's a whole range of other shit because they've got a whole farm, a massive property that they look after. And so I'd be looking at that as my niche. But generally speaking, the reason that you don't need to do full keyword research to validate a niche is because if you're looking at a niche and you see competition and you see enough suppliers, there's enough of a market there because none of those things would exist if there wasn't, right? Like, and this is the great thing about high ticket dropshipping is you're working with brands and suppliers that have been in the market for years and years and years. That means that there is a market and it means it's big enough. Like, particularly if you're in, in the US, it, it's hard to pick a niche in the US that is not at least a high nine figure in annual sales uh, across the industry. Most will be a billion dollars, right? Like, it's really hard, honestly, uh, if you look at it properly. And so... Uh, I don't really worry too much about size. I'm I'm really the, the only time that you have a size issue is if you pick a single product niche, right? Which is not what we recommend. It's not what we teach in our course. Um, it's what some other people teach in their course, uh, and it's a really stupid idea. Which is I'm just going to sell one product, and that's that's what I'm going to do. If you do that, then you will hit a cap. 
because there's only ever so many people buying one type of product in a market at any one point in time and you can hit a plateau there um we don't do that we we say you should have a store that has multiple product categories on it so that you're not uh, you don't you don't fall victim to that and you have the ability to uh sell multiple times to the same customer over time um so i hope that answers your question addy thank you very much for your question all right i'm going to go back to pre-submitted questions here uh next on the list is nick uh thank you nick for your question nick asks he's usa based uh he's navigating the llc creation my initial thought was to create an llc that can drop ship for more than one domain niche over time however i'm reading i would need to register a dba for each which sounds confusing if i ever need to sell or change niches in your experience is it easier to use the same llc and domain name for our niches or create one main llc and then do individual dba for each niche name that we want example sauna direct llc using the domain sauna direct versus dropship plus llc uh, dba sauna direct uh look this once again uh i mean i yeah I, i've seen p many people do it both ways um i i know people who um have an llc that is named exactly the same name as their website um or their the domain name of their website and i know many many people who have a different named llc um to their website and they have a, a dba that is different to their llc now i mean you're right yes you would need a, a dba um for each name that you have um or each website that you have uh, and then the third option is i've seen people who have llcs that have multiple um dbas and multiple websites under them um from a running the business perspective i don't think it matters whatsoever um from a selling the business perspective, yes, I, I suppose. I, I mean, I think it's I think it's simpler to have, um, you know, like multiple, like 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 a single LLC per business. So, like, I mean, for for a dropship breakthrough, for example, our company is Dropship Breakthrough LLC. Our business is Dropship Breakthrough. That's what it's called. Um, so. I think that's that's cleaner and simpler. You're going to have a separate set of books for each company, for ex for each business. Um, you shouldn't intermingle any of those things, like between businesses. Like if you're if you're going to have multiple dropshipping businesses, which I'm going to be honest, I don't think that's a good idea in the first place. Um, so, I, I mean, this wouldn't really be a question I'd be considering that heavily uh, until you've at least grown one drop high ticket dropshipping business to a pretty pretty high numbers, uh, but Leaving that aside, uh, you've got to have you're going to have different bank accounts and different all accounts are going to be separate for every website, regardless of whether you have a single LLC or multiple LLC. So I guess it's probably I, I think it's cleaner to keep everything separate personally. Um, but once again, that's a, that's that's just my personal view. Um, like I say, in terms of how biz those businesses perform, whether they're under a umbrella llc or they have their own llc it's gonna make no difference um when it comes to time to selling now uh, maybe it makes a difference it probably makes it look a bit cleaner for somebody yes uh once again when you sell a website though you don't have to send the company with it um that's not necessary you could transfer the company or the business to another llc um uh, or somebody could take the llc i suppose with it as well like i mean you know it could go either way. So once again, like not really a question in the beginning stages I would agonize a lot over for very long. Just make a choice and go with it. It's going to work out fine either way, realistically. But thank you for your question, Nick. All right. I'm um, going to go next to uh, a live question, Jim, from YouTube. Jim asks, uh, and thank you for your question, Jim. Um what are your thoughts on push notifications and pop unders, which I get pop unders, pop ups, pop unders. I don't know what a pop under is, honestly. Uh, push notifications, I can answer that one. Uh, push notifications, I don't really like them personally. Um, I think there was, I, I 
can remember when push notifications kind of really became a thing in in on websites and digital marketing i was already running uh businesses by then um and i think they're like often with these little kind of hacky tacky things i think they're hacky and tacky um they do they do hit a bit of a they do work for a while and they do work well for a while uh i don't really think that they work well. I can't remember, like personally, I can't remember the last time I enabled push notifications on a website that I went to. Like, really? Like, why do I care what a website is doing? I don't care about websites that much. Uh, and and like, so I, I don't think so. No, um, I, I don't think much of um, push notifications. I wouldn't bother wasting any time there. Um, um simply because I just don't know. They have a great uptake rate. They're distracting. Uh, I don't like things that distract people, particularly if somebody's on a, on a product page. I don't want to distract them at that point from making a purchase. Um, but once again, I don't, I don't really want to even think about it. I use them on my, on, on, I have used them on sites before. Uh, going back probably like years now, well, more than five years. I can't even remember when. Um, and I never really felt, there was, you know, a great need for them or a great effect of using them. And that may be because um, they didn't use them that well. Who knows? Maybe. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wouldn't really worry about them personally. Uh, there, There's just way more powerful marketing things that most people never really nail that they should be working on rather than worrying about those sort of things. But thanks for your question, Jim, very much. Um, Jordan? Back from pre-submitted questions here, Jordan asks, in my current non-dropshipping business, I have had businesses allow me to sell their items but do not offer dropshipping. I've had to order them, then ship them myself. Is this something common? Do most people have to specifically ask suppliers if they will dropship? Uh, yeah, well, I guess you're asking them without asking them. <laughs> so if I'm talking to a supplier... I don't ask them, can you drop ship products for me? I don't tend to use the term drop shipping in that scenario uh, simply because uh, there are people out there in the world who have uh, a negative impression of the term drop shipping uh, or it just, you know, whatever. I mean, let's be honest. There are a lot of shitbag drop shippers out there and have been over time. And there are suppliers that have had bad experience with people who call themselves drop shippers. Um, which is unfortunate um, for people who actually do it properly. So I don't use that term for that reason, but um, I will use different terminology, but I'm basically saying the same thing. So if I get on the on a call with a, a supplier and I'm talking to them for the first time, you know, I'll, I'll have a bit of initial conversation. Hey, how's your day going? Blah, 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 all that sort of thing. And then I'll say, hey, it's John here calling from Sauna's Direct Um we're an online retailer of saunas. I've uh, been checking out your brand, really love it. Uh, and I'd like to have a chat about, you know, selling your products, selling your saunas on our website. Yeah, yeah, yada, yada. And they'll say, oh, okay, interesting. Tell me more, whatever. And I'll say, yeah. So what we do is we work on a direct to customer basis. Basically, we pop your product, products on our website. We do all the marketing for them. We do all the customer service. And when one of our customers places an order on our site, we place that order with you. We pay for the products up front and we pay for them in full. And then we ship them directly from your warehouse to the customer. That's it. That's what I say. So that's how you say drop shipping without saying drop shipping, right? Um, you're telling them what's the fulfillment model that you would like to use. Now, at that point, they're going to go, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. We work with people who do that. Or they're going to go, oh, okay, like drop shipping. And you, you, then you can go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can kind of see where they want to go with it. Sometimes they'll say, oh, no, look, we don't do that. Um, but if you want to purchase some products in multiple numbers, we that's that's generally what we do. And then you can deal with that objection if you need to, if that comes up. But um, that's how um, you have that conversation. And you may sometimes t speak to suppliers who have never done drop shipping before, but it's not because they don't want to do it. It's sometimes, like, honestly, there are still niches out there where you can have this conversation where nobody's really asked them to do it and they, they haven't done it before but when the, you talk them through how it works it's you know they're open to the idea and so they might do it for you for the first time and um you know 
because uh, at the end of the day, you know, if they understand it properly, the, the, I think the biggest challenge for some suppliers is that um, they have misconceptions about it. Um, they have or, or they just haven't seen it work well for them yet. And so that that creates a bit of a barrier or, you know, they, they have some other agreements with other people that they sell through that kind of make them not want to do it, right? So your, your job is really just to convince them around those things. And that might take a few calls, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, that's how we do it, Jordan. Thanks for the question, mate. All right, back to live questions. This one comes once again from YouTube. Um, and apologies, I, I can't see your name, but it's coming up as Provision Online Marketing. Uh, hey, John, thoughts on lead gen getting emails for under $2 as the main source of customer acquisition versus driving traffic to product pages directly? Um, well, uh, like as a front end traffic generation, I mean, you're still going to end up sending people to a product page because that's where they're going to buy your products. So I'll, I'll leave that little distinction aside. Uh, your customer acquisition is always going to come through a product page. Um, but yeah, sure. I mean, in the beginning, so, and I'm only going to answer this in terms of high ticket drop shipping because I could care less about any other type of drop shipping. Um, uh, we send people to product pages in the beginning because Google Shopping is generally, um, or other you know, uh, Microsoft ads, you can do shopping ads there as well, for example, is generally in most niches a good source of bottom of funnel traffic that is very easy to acquire and very quick to acquire. And so you can start making some sales there. Um, and it, for bottom of the funnel traffic, which is, and once again, this is a very high ticket dropshipping specific thing. There are people in whatever niche you want to go into who are already searching for the products by name, like the names of the products that you're going to sell. So when you run, like that's what bottom of the funnel is in, in high ticket dropshipping. And so there is no point for those people trying to get their email because they have no reason to give you their email. They're about to buy the product. Their, their mind is sold. They're sold on a product. They're just looking for somebody to buy it from. So sending those people to anywhere but a product page makes zero sense at all, right? It's unnecessary um, because that person just wants to buy it. So let them buy it. Now, once you you get a bit of that traffic and you start making your sales there, then yes, over time you should be expanding out because sending top of funnel traffic to product pages is not generally a profitable strategy. So we don't do that. Um, this is part of the reason why in our program, Dropship Breakthrough, we have such a massive focus on uh, organic traffic, on search engine optimization, which is not going to be sending traffic to product pages. It's going to be sending traffic to content pages, it's going to be sending traffic to um, collection pages or category pages on your website, depending on the, on the keyword. And so that's what our focus over time is on, much more than paid traffic. Pay, you always do some paid traffic because it's appropriate for certain parts of the customer journey, right? Certain stages of, of, of the funnel, particularly the bottom. Um, but the reality is organic traffic is far more powerful and far more profitable over time. And yes, as part of that strategy, you're generally going to have email capture in there on your content pages as part of your content pages and, and, and your collection pages. And we have various ways of doing that so that you're building an email list and you're using your email list to generate further sales, right? Now, as, as part of doing that, you're going to develop assets, um, you know, that you can, that you could use more proactively to acquire emails, um, and you could run lead generation ads and that sort of thing to those assets or, or uh, mechanisms for people to, you know, um, subscribe to your email lists. Yeah, you absolutely can do that. And, you know, you've got to have a good back end built out to enable that. Um, the reason that you wouldn't do it in the beginning is because, you know, most people like to really nail lead gen, that's, that's a more advanced marketing strategy. Uh, and to do it for a high ticket is even more advanced, right? Um, than selling lower ticket products. Like it really is. Like the, the hurdle is a bit higher from that perspective. And most people who are starting an online business, uh, sorry, a, a high ticket dropshipping business with zero marketing or online experience, teaching them lead gen is not 
the place to start. Like there's far easier ways to get acquire people profitably uh, than that. And that's what we focus on. But absolutely. Uh, if you can do lead gen, you know how to do it and you can build out the content and the back end to do it successfully so that when, if you, if you're going to pay for that traffic, um, you know, uh, and I, I challenge you in a high ticket niche to always get emails under $2. I, I doubt that uh, it's possible, but I doubt you're going to do that at scale reliably over time in every niche. Um, you don't need to get it under $2 either. Like, you know, um, Go for it, sure. But I wouldn't launch a business there for sure. But thanks for your question. All right, uh, back to pre-submitted. Joshua asks, I have found that the majority of my calls are regarding tender requests, which has led me to looking into how to best approach tenders in Australia. Do you have any guidance as to how to best deal with this process? And also, I understand it's B2B, but it's slightly different due to being a tender. Well, do most B2B work off tender applications. Cheers. Thanks for the question, Joshua. Uh, interesting question. Um, certainly a lot of, there, there is a, a pretty good portion of B2B um, that will work via a tender process. Um, if you're like, I, I'd be interested to hear more about the nature of those calls. Like, are they a third party that is calling you? That, like we, we see this in, I think in one of our businesses in the US where you get calls from people who are essentially a third party inviting you to tender and they're actually a middleman in the tendering process. They're not actually you submitting a tender directly in the tendering process. Um, so I, I don't know if your calls are of that nature. I'll, I'll be honest, in Australia, I've never had a business that uh, relies heavily on tenders um, or sells products to businesses usually tendering processes are for a larger type of thing uh, so there's a lot of b2b that is not does not work off tender applications so my first business i sold to a lot of architectural firms uh, elect electrical contracting companies um, uh, interior designers that sort of thing I, I never submitted a tender once and i had probably 40 to 50 percent of the business there was b2b uh, right so um there, there's a lot of B2B sales that are not done via tender. Um, in my experience, it tends to be like larger, larger scale projects or businesses or government or council or things like this, right? Um, in which case, there, there often can be a tendering process and there are websites where you can go to look at tenders that are open that you can submit applications for or um, whatnot. And so... Um, there, there may be, uh, and it, it may vary like industry to industry. It may vary country to country. Uh, there may be requirements that your business has to fulfill to be able to tender um, in certain scenarios. There may be, you know, things. So you, you really have to do a bit of research into that. Um, I am by no means an expert, but I would say that if you want to, if you want to be putting in um, for like, um, you know, if you want to be competing in, in tender processes, which if it's relevant to your, to your niche, um, uh, I would certainly, you know, recommend, um, that you do that. Uh, you know, you should do that. Um, and you'll have to do a bit of research and it'll take a bit of practice and that sort of thing. But if you're getting contracted, uh, contacted by, um, third parties, uh, not to say that you can't work with those, but, um, you, um, should look into like what part of the process do they play and can you, is there a direct tendering process that you can go into? So like, for example, in Australia, for, for a government, um, parts of the government, they have their own websites where they just list the, their open tenders, um, you know, uh, you can view open tenders and, um, if, uh, some of them you can just go and, you know, put your hat in the ring for, um, yourself directly. And so I would do that, um, if that's relevant for you. So I hope that helps. All right. Back to the live stuff. Um, 
Harry asks uh, from Facebook, I'm working in a demanding day job nine to five. So finding it really difficult to get time to call suppliers. I have no suppliers yet and feel stuck. Do you have any advice? Um, do you get a lunch break? Um, can you take any time off work? Like, I, I mean, without knowing the nature of your nine to five job, it's probably a bit hard, but I mean, the reality is you probably like, if you want to get your first round of supplies on board, you probably need a day or two, like just a day or two to hit the phones, um, uh, and hit them really hard, like just call nonstop all day long. So if you can get, um, one or two days off work, I don't know if you, if you have leave or if you get like rostered days off or some sort of day off system at your, at your, uh, at your job, um, then I would think about doing that. Um, like take some leave, uh, call some, call suppliers and just, you know, if you can take a few days off, just really have that list ready and just go through it and keep calling keep calling like for an entire day. Um, and get your first, get your first supplies over the line. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's just some reality. If, if you don't have the time when you're at your job, you've got to make the time, um, because those calls have to happen. Um, you know, it's, it's not the sort of thing that's easy to outsource. So I know some people from time to time ask me that question. I have outsourced it before. Um, but it wasn't. To get it done well wasn't cheap. I'll say that. Um, so I used to have a fellow that I used to outsource calls to, and I was paying him about a thousand bucks a week um, to sit on a phone and make these calls for me. So, I mean, you can find people out there who can do it. Um, you know, you might not want to pay for it though, um, because th 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 there's a lot. You know, to, to have somebody who's like not you doing it, um, they've got to be pretty good. They've got to be pretty good at like have a sales background and that sort of thing. So it's possible, can be done. Um, yeah, but you've got to find a way to make the time. Um, and that can be difficult sometimes, but it can be done. You can do it, Harry. All right. Um, continuing in the live questions now, we've got a few coming through. Um, Ch Chem Sedine. Uh, and apologies if I've butchered the pronunciation of your name. Uh, my Shopify payment method was disabled and they removed it from my store. They are suggesting I select a different payment gateway. What do you advise? Is there a better solution? So I assume you're talking about Shopify payments. Um, uh, depends. It depends a little bit on where you're based and where your business is based and who you're selling to and whatnot. Um, if you're, uh, if you're running a business that's trying to sell internationally, or if it's based in the, in the U S and you're in another country, I think some of that stuff has got a little bit more tricky in recent times. Some, some payment gateways are tightening up a lot. Um, uh, around this sort of stuff, like allowing people who are based in one country to sell in another country or to sell internationally and all of that sort of thing. And to be honest, I can see why, um, you know, there's a lot of people who have been involved with e-commerce businesses in, in certain of certain types and in certain ways that have been absolutely terrible for payment processes. Um, you know, and so I, I can understand why they're wary. Um, you know, like if Shopify payments isn't working for you, you can try Stripe directly um uh there's a company uh called deposit d like deposit deposit with a y instead of an i um it's a funny spelling d p o s y t um which i don't know all of the rules of signing up with them um but they have come to me um pretty recommended as an alternate solution to the, you know, like the big names like Stripe. Um, so maybe you could look into them. Uh, and, and there are other ones out there. Uh, now, honestly, for me personally, I've, I've never been not able to use Shopify payments or Stripe with a, a Shopify account. So um, I, can't, I can't say from per, very personal experience, um, but, uh, you know, if, if I couldn't do Shopify payments, I would definitely 
look directly at Stripe um, or uh, that other option that I mentioned. The only downside of that is you are going to get slightly higher fees because uh, you're going to get hit with a double fee by Shopify if you use those payment gateways. Thanks for your question. All right, continuing down. Mbeam from YouTube asks, what's the next product I should try and sell? Can't tell you that, buddy. We're not looking for a product. Um, if you're new to the channel, this is high ticket drop shipping. There's a way to find products to sell and that's by finding the customer you're going to sell to. So I'd recommend go and listen to some of our videos on YouTube, uh, go onto our channel and just, you know, look for um, niche selection. And we have videos on how you do that, how you find the products that we try and sell. Um, it's kind of a, sounds like a low ticket dropshipping question, which is just a terrible way to do dropshipping. So I wouldn't even go there. The winning product thing is a load of nonsense. Uh, so, which kind of feeds into your next question. Is starting dropshipping advertising on TikTok organically going to work in today's day? Well, organic is not advertising for starters. Um, uh, organic, like, no, no, is my answer to that. Um, like, sure, you could post things, like, depends what you're trying to sell. Once again, if you're trying to flog dog eyelashes or some low ticket rubbish like that, um, yeah. Maybe you can get some hits on TikTok for sure, um, you know, but like why even go there? It's just a waste of time. Like build a, build, build it like that. That stuff can work for a month or two or three or four maybe. And then you're going to be, it's going to run out of steam and, you know, you're going to have to find the next winning product. Like that's not really how you build a business. One, I, I don't even think that classifies as a business. Like, it's not repeatable over time, which is part of the definition of what a business is. It's a repeatable process. So something that lasts two or three months or five or six, six months, it's not repeatable. Like you should be building a business that's going to last 10 years. Um, that's a business with value. So I would say, yeah, you can build a better business than that. So you should go and do that. Okay, guys, good questions there. Martin from YouTube again posts, I'm struggling to get sales. I'm wondering if it's because I'm not spending enough on Google ads or my website slash products suck. Well, Martin, um, you know, there, there's a lot that can go into answering that question. I think there, there definitely are a number of factors to consider if you're got a website up and running, you've got some products on it and um, you've, you know, you're struggling to make sales, you're paying for some traffic. Um, I think certainly uh, what products you're selling, whether, whether you're selling the right products. And once again, I don't, I don't know what your business is. So I'm, I'm answering this in a very general manner, right? Um, like, are you doing high ticket drop shipping? Are you doing some other type of drop shipping? Um, if, if you're doing some other type of drop shipping, don't do that is my advice. Um, uh, and that'll, that'll help you fix your problem. If you're doing high ticket drop shipping. Um, yeah. Okay. So thank you. I got your comment there. High ticket. So if you're doing high ticket drop shipping, you know, there certainly would be a question around potentially around, um, your, uh, niche, like assuming that's that you that you're in a good niche, let's let's assume that that you're in a in a niche that's viable, um, and you're not getting enough sales. Then definitely, you need to work for, through a few things. And and we've there, there's a few other videos out there that um, we've done in recent times that can give you some more detail. I mean, I'll answer your question here, but if you're looking for more resources on this, there's certainly uh, we did a podcast episode on the Dropship podcast, the video of which is also on YouTube, which is where you are right now. Um, which was like, how, how, how do I get to 6,000 a month in profit? Like, what do I need? It was essentially, what do I need to do to get to 6,000 a month in profit? Um, and there's a few other videos about, Hey, I just launched my business and I'm not getting sales. What should I do next? Um, so if you go find those videos, they'll give you some additional insights here. Um, but there, there's, there's a number of things that you would look at in that scenario. Once again, assuming your niche is, is good, 
Um, let's assume that um, if it's if it's not, I mean, that, that's another question. Um, firstly, I, I would be looking at your, you, you say you're running Google ads. Um, oh, I mean, you can share your niche if you want to, buddy. I, I don't mind. Um, if you're running Google ads, there is a question around what's the quality of the traffic. So whenever you're having conversion issues, I like to work through something I call, that's called the 40-40-20 um, principle, which was developed by a guy many, many years ago, many years ago um, in direct mail, uh, which is, uh, and it, it basically takes you through looking at the quality of the person who's looking at um, your offer, which is the product you want to sell, the price you're selling it at, et cetera, et cetera. So you look at that, um, the, the quality of your offer and how that compares to your market and then the presentation of your offer, right? So the first thing you got to look at when it comes to Google Ads is, is like what's the quality of your traffic? So not all traffic that you can acquire through Google Ads and presumably you're using Google Shopping is created equal. So a mistake that people, I do see people make is they don't have their campaign set up properly and they're just getting, not getting the right traffic. Uh, Google shopping for high ticket products is a middle to bottom of the funnel exercise. So the search traffic you should be acquiring or focusing on there is primarily going to be bottom of the funnel traffic only. If you're paying for a lot of top of funnel traffic, it's probably not going to convert very well. Um, which kind of goes back to a question I answered earlier in, the, in this session. So you want to have a think about that uh, and you need to check your Google ads to make sure you're getting the right traffic. Now, if you're getting the right traffic um, that's coming to your site um, and um, uh, and it's not converting, then you got to look at your offer. So your offer is like, it's the product you sell, it's the price you're selling it at, it's your shipping, it's your returns, it's you know, do you have a, a price guarantee? It's, you know, any other value that you add into the process, it's your customer service and, and how proactive that is uh, and so on and such forth. Um, and so you need to look at that and so like, like what is being communicated with your customer? Because remember, like when customers are buying high ticket branded products, right? The last question, one of the last questions that they're answering is not, is this the right, product like is this the right product they answer that question the last question they actually are answering consciously or subconsciously is where is the best place for me to buy this from like who do i want to buy this from because when you're drop shipping for a high ticket you're you're a reseller which means there are also usually other people selling the same product as you and your customers get is in a lot of cases going to find those right particularly when they're at the bottom of the funnel particularly on places like Google Shopping, which is a comparison shopping engine, right? So let's imagine the customer's got your website open in front of them and then they've got somebody else's website that sells the same product. They're on their product page in another tab in their browser and then they've got a third one open, same product, another tab in their browser, right? And they're looking at three different websites and they're going, well, I want this product. Who's the best person to buy it from? What's your compelling case to your customers about why they should buy from you? That's your offer. Uh, and we actually did an, on, on this topic another episode on the Dropship podcast um, just the other day around um, uh, like how to how to build your offer as like one of the most recent episodes. So go and listen to that one if you want to hear more about offers. Um, and of course, in Dropship Breakthrough, our course, we literally have a module basically devoted to this um, of taking you through this. So you've got to have an offer that is communicated to your customers on your product pages and throughout your website, not just your product page. It should be on your home page, should be on your collection pages, should be on your about us page, et cetera, et cetera. But it's definitely got to be on your product pages and you've got to understand how that stacks up against your competition within your niche, right? Because it's, it's whoever has the best or the most unique or something like that offer, right? So you've got to have that. Um, and that's something that a lot of people, particularly in the early stages, haven't worked out properly yet. Um, so you check your traffic. You want to know if your offer is good um, and that it's presented well on your website, right? So that customers understand it. Like you've really got to slap people in the face with it. You can't hide it down in the footer or down the bottom of the page or something like that or on some policy page somewhere because ain't nobody reading those things. 
Um, and then if you've answered those questions and you're like, well, I think I'm doing the best I can in those areas and you're still not um, getting sales and, and presuming that you're getting enough traffic to your site as well, which is part of your question, wondering if you're not spending enough on Google. Well, you know, just you got to figure that a high ticket dropshipping site is going to convert at 1% or less. It's not going to convert higher than 1% on at least not in any significant numbers, right? And this is different to other types of e-commerce out there. So if some smart ass is going to pipe up who's not high ticket drops, you can go, oh, but I've heard that sites convert at 2% or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, that's other e-commerce, right? Um, so it's going to be like less than 1%. You know, like I've been part of eight-figure stores that convert at like 0.3% at scale, right? Um, that means that, you know, per like you're let's say you're 1%, you need 100 visitors for every one sale. That's 1%, right? So if you're primarily paying for traffic, then you, know, you get 100 clicks to get a sale, right? Um, if you're at 50, a 0.5% conversion rate, then it's going to be 200 clicks per sale. So you can stack up how much traffic you're getting and that's quality traffic. That's not like just 100 any old clicks, 100 quality clicks per sale, right? Um, so look at your traffic. I mean, if you're not getting those sort of numbers regularly, then you shouldn't expect lots of sales. So that should help you answer the question of whether you should spend more or not. Um, uh, and by spending more, usually the first step there is just to bid higher on, you, you know, bid higher for quality keywords and see if that gets you a bit more exposure. Um, and then the last thing I'll throw in here, which is once again, is a bit of a high ticket dropshipping specific thing is within your niche, and this is very niche dependent, there are going to be brands that sell better than others. I mean, this is true in any niche, in any industry. There are just brands that customers tend to buy online more than others. And so once again, one of the mis one of the traps pe I've seen people fall into in the early stages with a high ticket dropshipping business is that, you know, that you go through your first round of supplier calls and let's say you've got I don't know, 30 suppliers that you could potentially call in your niche that you've identified at that stage. You know, you start making some calls in the beginning, you get some yeses, you get some no's, probably get a whole bunch you don't get in touch with or you don't get a response from, and, but you get some yeses. You're like, oh, well, I got four or five brands that said yes, fantastic. I can go and put those on my website and launch my business, start paying for my traffic, which you absolutely can do and you absolutely should. And, you know, you might luck in that some of those are, are good selling brands, but you also might find that the five that you got on board in that first round of calls out of the 30 are not the five that many customers want to buy online. I mean, th those brands might still be selling, but they might be selling offline. They might be selling in different ways, right? Uh, and so with a new business, you really have to continue pushing hard on adding supplies to your store so that you can find the brands that are going to work best for your business. Um, and so you can't ever take your foot off the pedal of trying to get like more and more suppliers. Um, now there, there, there is a limit to how many you're going to get over time in any niche, right? I mean, there's a hard limit on that, but you've got to try and reach that limit. Uh, and so calling people back, going back to supply calls, continue at, continuing to add brands to your store um, is something that you need to do when you're high ticket dropshipping. I, I can't stress that highly enough. Like one of your superpowers as a business when you're a high ticket drop shipper is that you're not constrained by holding stock right you don't have to hold stock so there is no co real cost to you from having 10 brands on your site versus five right whereas somebody who's doing a more traditional e-commerce business model they are constrained right they can't just put 50 brands on their site and buy products from all of them because that's going to cost them you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, right? Which they might not have. Um, and so you're not constrained by that. And so you actually have to utilize that um, because if you don't utilize, you know, drop shipping has downsides, right? And so you've got to offset those downsides by taking advantage of your superpowers. And this is one of them. So that, that's a mistake I often see people make is they think they're not getting sales because there's something wrong with their niche or their traffic or whatever. And sometimes it's just because you haven't got the right brands on your site yet. Um, and if somebody's going to ask me, well, how do I know in advance what the right brands are? I'm going to, you don't. 
uh, you can't know because even even different brands will sell better on some sites versus others. So there there is no pick up the phone and call them all and keep calling them all and don't stop calling them all. Um, you know, call call people back, call people back, call people back, talk to them again and again. Like you've got to be just relentless with it. Uh, and trust me, I mean the the payoff for doing so is very well worth it. Um, but you've got to do it. So thank you, Martin, for your question. I hope that's helpful in some ways for you. Uh, next question coming in from YouTube. Good times. Yeah, I like good times. Good on you, good times. Which platform is the best for high ticket dropshipping paid ads? And how much bare minimum should someone have to spend for ad spend to get started? Well, uh, on the you know the day you start your business for high ticket paid ads is, is definitely going to be um, uh, is definitely going to be Google Google Ads Google Shopping ads in particular within the Google Ads ecosystem. I think that's still the best. Uh, yes, these days, you know, it can be frustrating to open a Google Merchant Center account. Um, you know, Google has, uh, you know, made it a little bit more difficult to get that going than it used to be. Um, it'll still get going sooner or later, and it, it's still it's still the best, simply because of the nature of high ticket products and and high ticket dropshipping. You're selling branded products. You're selling products that have been in the market for time. Uh, they often have model names that people know and things like this. And so there are people on a search network who are already searching for them. And so the easiest way to make sales is to go find those people and sell to them. It's not to like get in front of people who have never heard of the products before or anything like that, like on social media and go, hey, want to buy this $5,000 product today, right now? Nobody, nobody's going to do that. Nobody just goes, oh, wow, look at that product on social media. I'm going to whip out my credit card and give you 5K for it right now. That's not how it happens, right? So you want to hit first up people who are already searching for the products that you're going to sell. And so that's going to be on a search network because that's where people go when they know what to buy. Nobody's going onto Facebook and searching for a product, a high ticket product, right? That, that doesn't happen. Um, and so you want to be there. Um, and once again, Google shopping ads are, are, the, are the best for that particular type of traffic in the beginning. Now as to how much is the bare minimum someone should spend per day um in our course we recommend um thirty dollars a day um uh, and that thirty dollars a day is gonna be regardless kind of of the country you're in so if you're in the us it's thirty dollars a day if you're in australia it's thirty dollars a day if you're in the uk it's well maybe it's a bit different there maybe 25 pound or something like that um that, that's that's going to be the number uh, that I would recommend. You can, you can go lower than that. Um, but the trouble with that is it's going to be really slow. Um, and it's going to be hard for you to like gather enough data to make assumptions about what's working and what's not. And it's going to take you a while to make any sales that really give you any indication of what's working. So $30 a day is the minimum that we recommend. Like I say, you probably could go a bit lower than that, but you've got to understand that if you do, you're going to move a bit slower as a result. Um, but you could do that. But if somebody's like, oh, can I start with $5 a day or something on ads? The answer is no, you can't. Like, it's just not going to work. Um, but uh, thank you. And look, I mean, there are other ads that you run over time. That's just like where you start, Google shopping ads. Um, but there are other ads within the Google Google Ads network that you'll run over time. Of course, Microsoft has their own ads system, which can can work very well for in a lot of high ticket dropshipping niches. You you can utilize those. Over time, you do utilize uh, social media advertising primarily for remarketing, which where it can work quite well. Um, and then you know there's probably some other options as well as you as you go further up the funnel. Uh, I answered a question earlier on like lead generation. You can use content. Um, to advertise in a range of different places as well um, outside of Google. Um, so, uh, yeah, hope that helps you. Good times. Uh, next one down. How do I set up conversion tracking properly on Google Ads? I installed Tag myself, but still not recording conversions. Fiverr, question mark. Um, 
Well, there's a couple of things to say here. The first thing to say here is that Google conver ads conversion tracking never works perfectly anymore, um, particularly for a high ticket dropshipping business. I just, it just, it's just the way that, I mean, it's still cookie based tra tracking primarily. And that, that's just got so many holes in it these days that it never works perfectly. So if you're not tracking, if you're tracking zero conversions, um, then it, it could be a problem with your tag. Um, honestly, the way that I install these on every high ticket dropshipping site is via, um, so we use the Simprosis Google Shopping Feeds app. Um, Uh, and they just integrate it for you. There's there's a little setting in there that just installs it for you, and I find that works. Uh, I, I'm yet to see it not work. Um, so that that's how I do it. Um, I'm sure you probably you could you can hire people as well, obviously, to help you set up uh, tracking tags and that sort of thing. But I mean that that's an app that I use anyway, um, and so I just use their their little integration thing that they do to set, like covers your your um conversion tracking and your remarketing tags stuff as well um but yeah um so just just bear that in mind but on, on the conversion tracking thing there's other things you have to keep in mind like for high ticket dropshipping like for example that a lot of people don't realize uh like if you do draft orders in your shopify account they're never going to get tracked anyway because they just don't happen through your regular checkout um so you're always going to see that Google ads tracks a different number to what shows up in your Shopify account uh, as, as sales. Like your Shopify account, of course, is, is the final source of truth for how many sales you made and how much revenue you made. And I haven't seen those numbers line up properly for years now. Um, so if it's, not, if it's not tracking anything, then there probably is a tag. If it's just not tracking the right number, then that's not net, that's probably not a problem with your tag. That's just the way it is these days. Um, Rod, hey buddy, been a while. Uh, thanks for dropping by. Uh, you ask, just wondering if dropshipping is ever saturated, as everybody is getting into it. Uh, good question. I don't think so. Um, once again, I mean, dropshipping being a broader term, if I talk about high ticket dropshipping, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I think there's still plenty of space. Um, you know, I mean, we're still coming up with niche ideas that I know no one is doing because I go and look at them and nobody's doing them. Um, and, uh, even more where I look at them, where, where nobody's doing them well. Um, you know, I mean, we, uh, ben and I recently partnered up with somebody who's got a high ticket dropshipping store in a niche where like there are other dropshippers there, but not a single one of them is nailing organic traffic, which is massive in any niche. And so it's like, yeah, that, sometimes there's dropshippers there, but like, if I'm honest with you, the majority of dropshippers are not doing a good job. So I don't really care if their site is there, like if they're not doing a good job, like who cares? And so like, I don't think everybody is getting into it either. I mean, there, there's a lot of, let's, let's be real. There's a lot of noise on, on social media about drop shipping. And there's a lot of these pimply faced little 20 year olds running around blowing on about, Oh, digital product drop shipping now is the latest thing and shit like that. Like that doesn't, that like the noise doesn't equal the reality is what I'd say when it comes to drop shipping. Um, and so, yeah, there's plenty of space and there's reasons for that. People come and go for one. So it's not like a, it's not like a linear thing where more people start dropshipping businesses and it just keeps going up like this, right? Like people drop out as well. So it goes like this. People drop out, people sell their businesses, businesses get acquired and rolled into other businesses. Um, the markets themselves are getting bigger. So the e-commerce industry grows every year, which means more customers are purchasing products online every year. So that means every niche, I mean, and I'm generalizing here, of course, but every niche gets bigger every year. Like there's more revenue to be had. There's more sales to be had. There's more customers buying. Of course, that accelerated pretty hard around COVID and things like that. And it had a massive jump, but 
it's still it's back to its kind of pre-COVID sort of growth uh, side of things. Um, so no, I, I don't see that. I think there are different, definitely niches that become too competitive uh, or become less competitive over time. And so there, there are definitely some niches out there where I would say, hey, don't go and start in that niche because it's 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 not a good place to start because there's a lot of competition. There's probably too much competition. Um, that definitely has been the case. I think, you know, like, um, and there's definitely some of those. I mean, classic one that I always talk about is like e-bikes, uh, electric bikes, electric scooters, that sort of thing. Uh, saunas and those sort of products is definitely one of those. Most homewares falls into that category. Um, but I, I mean, we haven't recommended people do those products for like five to six years either, to be fair. Um, but like I say, we're constantly um, coming up with niche ideas still that nobody's really doing, um, you know? And so, yeah, I definitely don't think it's too... Like you can't think of drop shipping as like drop shipping is saturated because it's like, um, you know, dr drop shipping is just a method of fulfillment. It's not a it's not even a business model. Like people who think dropshipping is a business model are just wrong. You're running an e-commerce business. You're running a retail business. Dropshipping is just the way that products are fulfilled within your business. Everything else is just e-commerce, right? So, um, you kind of you kind of have to look at it on a on a on a niche specific basis because every niche is different. Every niche has different competition levels, um, and I think that's the better way to consider it. But thanks for your question. Right. All right. Back to another question here. Started starting high ticket dropshipping 10 months ago and I'm doing around 20K in monthly revenue with a 20 times ROAS. Oh, that's pretty good. Good on you for getting to that point. Um, how do you know when to start increasing ad spend? Do you recommend a percentage increase? Okay. Well, uh, 20 times ROAS should be pretty profitable for generally for a high ticket dropshipping business, you're going to be looking at usually 10 times, if, if you're at 10 times ROAS or better, you're, you're going to be in a, in a, in a pretty decent spot. Um, so if you're at 20 times ROAS, you, you, you definitely should start increasing your ad spend um, because you're probably underspending a little bit there. Um, so the, probably the better question is how, like how do you know where to start increasing your ad spend within your ad account? Like, so uh, once again, I, I'm saying this without any knowledge of your business, what you're selling, how many products you have, how many brands you have, all this sort of thing. There, as, as with anything in marketing, there, there's a whole bunch of it depends to it, right? It depends on a lot of factors, but I would be looking at, um, you know, there are metrics that you can look at like search impression share, search absolute top impression share and things like this within your Google ads account to see where your opportunities are to increase your spend. Um, and ideally those are going to be in areas like for traffic that is already providing you a return. Um, most people I see who are, who are running Google shopping ads are not bidding competitively enough. And so they're probably a little bit under where they need to be. And sometimes that's because you're not seeing the conversions and that's fair enough. But other times, if you are seeing the conversions, you can probably go a bit harder. Um, do I recommend a percentage increase? I, I do recommend that you incrementally advance. Yes. You, you don't want to go and like do a massive increase. So I'd probably be, you know, and when we say increase, you're probably, the increase is probably firstly going to come by increasing your bids. And then at some point you may need to increase your daily budget. It depends whether you're generally reaching your budget or not every day. Um, so, um, if, yeah, I probably like, it, it depends. Um, it depends. It also depends on how much more you can spend. You want to spend like there, there's a range of factors. I'd, I'd probably generally, as I increase bids, though, I'd be increasing in a 20 to 30% range incrementally to see like, because remembering when you increase bids, what you pay isn't actually what you bid. Your average CPC is usually lower than your bid just based on the type of auction system that Google runs. Um, and so you, you kind of want to do incremental advancements and, and see what, 
that does because the risk you run is obviously if you go really big like 50 to 100 percent in a lot of cases you might start overspending um and it's better just to you know you want to find where are the increments where you get the best return uh, and so i might increase bids leave them for a week come back at after a week review the traffic and say okay like based on that bid increase you use the date compare feature in your ad account like what 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 change did i see how did my impressions change how did my clicks change how did my click through rate change do i can i identify an increase in sales in that time period um and if all of that looks good uh and you like the direction it's going in then you could do another 20 to 30 percent and run the same thing again. Do it for a week, come back, compare the week to the week before. Or you could do it over a two-week period or something like that if you don't have a ton of traffic. Um, the more traffic that you have, the quicker you can do these tests because you need a, you know, you need a statistically viable amount of data to say whether whether a marketing test is valid or not. You know, like you can't do it off like a hundred clicks because you might like one sale every hundred clicks, let's say. I mean, that's not really going to tell you much. Um, so the time period you run it over will be dependent on how much traffic you actually get. Um, but I mean, that, that's kind of how I would be thinking about it, but you know, 20 times rise, you probably should definitely be spending more, but that's not to say, you know, if you've been in it for 10 months, you should also be doing SEO and all these other sort of things as well. Um, at that, at that time period. So, uh, don't focus too much on your ads. Um, Uh, Martin asks, is it something about momentum when running ads? I've always wondered why $5 a day doesn't work with Google ads, doesn't work as well as on Facebook ads. Um, if I pause an ad after it receives 40 clicks and I start the ad, I basically start over. Like how exactly does the algorithm work in that way? It doesn't work well with small budgets. Uh, it's different. So Facebook has a very different algorithm to Google. Let's say Google shopping ads, as you might expect. They're just fundamentally different advertising platforms um you know uh, facebook is like google is driven by search traffic and what searches are happening and that sort of thing facebook is not i mean they're just very they're very different algorithms and yes um you know starting and stopping facebook campaigns and once again i'm generalizing a little bit here can affect their performance because their algorithm um needs to go through a learning process to optimize your ads and so you've got to allow it to do that um and so you know starting and stopping and at super low budgets can make it very difficult particularly if you're running like a lead or conversion based uh kind of campaign in facebook um because the, the algorithm's not going to have enough data or conversions or whatever to learn from um, now, in Go the way we do Google Shopping, we don't rely on con like um, we don't rely on Google's AI at all. Like they're they're AI driven bidding or you know conversion driven bidding and things like that. We we don't utilize because of conversion volume with high ticket being significantly lower than low ticket because our average order value is significantly higher. Um, and so we on Google low low budgets like five dollars a day like for your best value traffic you're going to be paying more than a dollar a click like for your super converting traffic so if your budget is five dollars a day and you're paying a dollar plus a click um you're going to get like less than five clicks a day and you're going to ma max out your budget and so like this is why like i mean if, if i know there's a lot of people watching here on youtube and maybe they're not in our course like you need to learn how to do this stuff properly um simply because if you try and piece it together yourself you're not and you're going to waste a ton of money on ads that just don't work um like which is how i learned how to do ads so i'm just speaking from experience i've spent you know tens of thousands of dollars if not more than a hundred thousand dollars testing things on ads that didn't work over over my over my time um and so <laughs> you you can you can miss that um uh so i mean that's why the low budget doesn't work on google like i mean we have once again businesses um our, our students have businesses where you know they're spending you know between five and ten dollars per click for some of their traffic and they're making profitable sales from that traffic right so once again a five dollar a day budget you're just not going to get any traffic at that 
in in that sort of scenario. Uh, now, I don't say those numbers to scare anybody off, but like, I mean, that's you know, that's um, that's just that's that's what it's about. It's just about you. You can't get any clicks in five dollars a day, really. Um, so you're not going to get any data. You know, it's it's going to take you a month of clicks just to make one sale, and like, you know, it's not gonna, it's not really necessary. Uh, hey, Mark, nice to see you, buddy. Um, all right, Good Times comes back with another question. How do you handle customer service and phone calls and customer service as a beginner? How much time does that take per month? Um, how do I handle it? I would handle it by not thinking too hard about it. Um, just do it. Phone rings, answer it. Um, if your question is relating more back to you've got a job maybe, which most people do when they get started and, and you can't answer the phone every time it rings because you're doing your job uh, and that doesn't allow it. I mean, that, that's a different question. Um, in that scenario, like until you get to the point where you can hire somebody to answer the phone for you, which is probably earlier than a lot of people think it is, um, just set up a great message, message, voice message system. Say, hey, look, we're really busy right now leave us a message and we'll, we'll call you back and and you'll call people back and a lot of times when you call people back you'll still get the sale sometimes you'll miss it because you were too slow but it doesn't matter like there's always more customers there's always more sales and there's always more money these are these are not the limited things in life time is the limited thing in life right so um Message bank, if you're in your job, call them back in your lunch break, call them back in your morning tea break, call them back in the evening after work. You can still call people at six o'clock at night, customers, that's fine. In fact, some customers will think you're going above and beyond to do that, um, you know, and so I would do that. Um, how much time does that take per month? It's a little hard to say. Definitely some niches have um, more customer service than others. I will say that for sure. Um, this is not a reason. This is not a niche selection factor either. So don't don't be thinking, oh, I'm going to go and try and ch choose a niche that has low customer service. That's the wrong way to think. Completely the wrong way to think about it. Um, it's not going to be a lot. Like honestly, in the beginning, you you, you would be lucky to get uh, one phone call every day in the first few weeks, right? And then it's, it's going to gradually build up past there. I mean, in some spaces, you might come out of the gates really hard just because a mix of things came together for you and you just got some great products on there that, that are in high demand. You might get a little bit more than that. But honestly, it's not going to be more than a, a phone call a day um, in the beginning, right in the beginning. So, yeah, that's what I'd say. All right, guys. Well, that looks like um, our questions for today. I've, I've reached the end of the list. Uh, so thank you very much for... Um... Oh, no one's come in. It's a late closer. Uh, I'm back again. I absolutely hate my nine to five. No motivation and don't belong there. My business makes 20K in sales, 2K profit monthly. And I have 20,000 saved. I'm a 29-year-old male and single. Should I quit and go all in? Well, big question. Good question. Uh, look, at the end of the day, you know, your, your appetite for risk is going to be your appetite for risk. And so that, that's different for everybody. I tend to err on the more riskier side in life. Um, that, that has always been my approach to things. Um, I, I'll say a couple of things here, though. Um, you're 29, male and single. There is never going to be an easier time in your life to go all in, right? If you, you know, get married, have a partner, have kids, etc. This question gets significantly harder to answer. Um, you know, you get to a point maybe you you own property or something like that. I don't know if you you have that mortgages or anything like that now. Um, but certainly it it gets harder. So literally, like to anybody who's listening to this in their in their twenties that is um, has you know less responsibilities at this stage in your life, you should be doubling down on business in every single way that you can and giving up a lot of other things in your life at that point, honestly, because um, if you can if you can make some great headway in that situation, then it's going to make a lot of things that come later in life easier. 
um, and, and easier to manage your business around as well. Um, so your questions here, obviously, you've got 20K saved. You know your, your rough profit. You can, I think it's reasonable to plan that that monthly profit, if you're, if you're all in, that that monthly profit is going to increase month on month. Um, you know, if it's not, then you're really doing something wrong if you're putting, devoting your energy to it. Um, so that's going to go up. You've got 20K saved. You know what your average monthly expenses are, let's say, in, in your life, you know, whether you're renting or, or food, all that sort of stuff. So work out your budget there and then say, where does that, you know, if you had zero profit coming in, how far does that 20K that you've saved get you? Um, does that make you feel comfortable enough? Knowing that this, this decision is never going to feel completely comfortable and it shouldn't, right? This should be a challenging and slightly scary decision to make. Um, and that's fine. That's good, uh, right? So, I mean, and, and then think about like, you know, what's your, like, let's say it doesn't work out, you know, uh, and you have to go back to work. Like in your circumstance and your, your, your experience, like how easy do you think it's going to be to go and get, get work so you can continue to pay your bills if you have to? I mean, if you sit there and think, well, yeah, I mean, I've got some skills, some knowledge that's going to make it reasonably easy, easily for me to find work if I have to, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like I would, I mean, if, if, if it were me and I say this not as financial advice or anything like that, I would probably say, yes, do it. I mean, I think, you know, you, you've got a business that's making profit. You've proved enough that there's something there that you can take further, take to 4K a month in, in profit, then take to 6K a month in profit, then take to, you know, up onwards and upwards. Um, so I, I, I would probably say yes. If it, if it were me, I would simply because of the stage of life that you're at is the easiest stage of life to do such a thing. Um, and you, you got a bit of cash saved up. Your business is, is profitable. So yeah, that's probably, uh, and you know, the, the challenge then is to make use of that time, right? Like I say, I mean, if you, if you, if you go full time with your business and, it's not, it doesn't grow past where you're at, then you're really doing something wrong. So yeah, I'd probably say go for it. And on that bombshell, we will wrap things up. So thank you for your questions, everybody. Thanks for being here. If you're watching along, uh, if you're listening to it later and you want to uh, get started with high ticket drop shipping and you'd love to do it with our help uh, so that you don't waste tons of money on things like ads and other things we've talked about on this call, head to dropshipbreakthrough.com forward slash join or if you'd like to have a chat with us beforehand, which we'd love to do, go to dropshipbreakthrough.com forward slash call uh, and you can book in a free call with us. Uh, until next time though, see you later. Thanks for listening to the Dropship Podcast. You can find all the show notes for this episode at dropshippodcast.com. And if you're ready to take the next step in your dropshipping journey, we invite you to join us inside Dropship Breakthrough, where John and I will walk you through step-by-step -step in starting your own high-ticket dropshipping e-commerce business. But that's not all. Dropship Breakthrough will also teach you everything you'll need to know to grow your business and take it to the next level. So head over to dropshipbreakthrough.com and sign up for our free training that will help you take the first steps towards building and growing your own profitable high-ticket dropshipping business.